All right, Dave, welcome uh, to my embryonic YouTube channel, uh, guest number two, um, another sort of industry heavyweight and someone uh, who was in the in the room at at, uh, at Snowbird way back in February 2001. Um, uh, enough, enough of the heavyweight, please. Well, you know, <laughs> no, that's not what you know. What I mean. Under, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we were talking earlier before this started, and you were, you know, talking about your love of history, understanding the history of a, the, the context of a topic. And um, I, I think that my sort of mission for this for this channel is actually to really understand agile software development from a from a historical point of view um, before we get into sort of what's happening today. So, thanks for joining uh, me this afternoon. Um, the 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 sort of format is very very crude very simple we're just going to talk about what you think uh has gone well you know look, looking back at snowbird with the benefit of 20 years hindsight we'll look at look at that then we'll talk about things that you think haven't gone well could be things which were just misconceived at the time not understood properly or perhaps the industry's just changed um and then maybe we can bring it to a close by looking at um you know some ideas that you may or may not have for for things that we could do to improve you know quality of software and particularly software development i think that would be loosely speaking but before we do any of that i have to ask a burning question all right tell me a little bit about what happened in that room I, i'm sure people would just love to know so excuse me <clears throat> um I would say that going into that meeting, we arrived the day before the meeting started. So I can't remember what day of the week it was, but we all flew in and we got there. Most of the people got there by sort of tea time. Um, so we met up in the kind of lounge of this lodge. I probably knew half the people already. Um, other people like Kent knew everybody. Um, but I wasn't the only, only one who hadn't met other people. So we spent that day, that evening, um, we went to dinner, uh, getting to know each other a bit. Um, and didn't much talk about the subject of the meeting, just really, you know, what we were all doing. The next day we got into the, uh, the room and the first thing we did is we moved all of the chairs and tables out to the side. And then we organized the chairs into a circle or actually an oval. And we all sat down and we basically tried to set, come up with how we were going to do this. You know, what was the process? And we weren't getting too far in that. And someone, I think it might have been Martin Fowler, I cannot remember, brought out a deck of index cards and handed them around and said, okay, everybody write on this. Um, I think it was something like, what do you want to see as a result of this meeting? And so we all had fun writing on the index cards and then practicing throwing them into a pile in the middle, seeing how accurate we could be. Uh, and then we gathered them up and divided them and categorized them. And we came up with some um, kind of overarching common interests. And from that, we kind of scheduled or prioritized the things we're going to talk about. Um, and really from the first discussion, the first focus discussion we had, it was pretty clear that everybody was on roughly the same page. There were uh, a lot of nuances, uh, but we were all looking for ways of making things more uh, accurate or efficient or whatever the word would be by shortening the length of time it took to do them and by gathering feedback along the way. Um, and so that, that was very, very common. Um, how, how we did that, eh, not so much. Um, we broke for lunch and my memory, and it was very, it was cordial. Um, it was, you know, it, I wouldn't say that we were like having a, a party, but we were not, you know, we were enjoying ourselves. We broke for lunch. Um, and if I remember rightly, Martin Fowler and I were standing at the blackboard and we were kind of in the, how are we gonna herd all these cats mode? We're trying to find a way of getting people more focused on actually producing something. And somehow in that discussion, 
we came up with this, um, just we came up with the sentence of, you know, uh, this is okay, but this is better, you know? And we kind of liked that because what it did is it didn't say your way is wrong. You know, we honor your way, but we think we may have a better way. Um, and so we started exploring that. And on the right, right board, I think we wrote down three, you know, very rough forms of three of the four manifesto values. Um, you know, that's, you know, while we value this, we prefer that. Um, and uh, people kind of wandered over to see what we were doing. And it was really fascinating. Everybody jumped on the fact that you could do these compare and contrast as a way of, of uh, thinking about stuff. And so um, there's a picture that Ward Cunningham took. Uh, he stood on a chair and took a picture of the group of us standing around the whiteboard. And uh, that's the one he used as the background to the uh, Agile Manifesto website. Mm -hmm. um, it's just basically everybody standing there with yeah. the whiteboard. Classic, classic, iconic photo. Yeah, yeah. And um, if I remember rightly, we came out of that, that kind of like group discussion with five. And everybody asked me what the fifth one is, and I cannot remember. Um, and then we whittled it down to four. And then we changed the wording around to be, um, we value this over that. Um, and we worked a bit on the, the introductory sentence, which was really important to us because we wanted to set a tone of exploration and not these are tablets being handed down from on high, mm. you know? Mm. So we wanted to get across the idea that these were things that we discovered, not things that we believed. Um, and so we did that and that pretty much took the first day. Um, and if I remember rightly, we broke relatively early and people went skiing. I didn't, but people went skiing. Um, and it was kind of like that first day felt very productive and everybody felt really happy with what we'd done. Um, second day, to some extent, we kind of felt, well, we've got the room booked. We should do something. Right. And um, that's where we did the, uh, is it 12 practices? 12 principles. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I always felt that was kind of like uh, not particularly useful. Um, so and it turns out actually in a way it was because it actually uh, crystallized some things like testing um, that I think were the positives that came out, came out of that whole thing. Mm -hmm. But that, that was kind of it. Um, and then I think basically we all kind of hung around. I think there was another half day at the end. I can't remember. Um, and all we went on merry ways. Um, Ward Cunningham and I, oh, well, Ward Cunningham uh, got the Agile Manifesto website. And uh, I wrote some, I can't remember what it was now, Pearl, maybe, that ran behind it to collect signatory names. Um, and that was kind of it. And this was kind of prior to a whole bunch of social media and the concepts of vir you know, viral, whatever. Um, so we kind of like just left it out there. And I would love to see the stats, but it felt like the growth of the number of signatories was exponential. You know, we got a couple the first couple of days and then it just went faster and faster and faster. And we like crossed 10,000 and then I don't know what. Um, and so it was pretty clear there was something of a, an interest in it. Which you just cool. hit the right the right message at the right time in the right way. Yeah, and, I oh. think so. Yeah, um, and it's just pure luck, pure luck. Well, um, it's not perhaps not quite pure luck. It was it was uh, you know a lot of very smart, experienced people in a room trying to solve a hard problem, um, which needed to be solved at the time, right? So, well, yeah, we call that a committee. <laughs> uh, they don't always work, um, but yeah, I mean, this one particularly, this one did, I guess. Um, so that was nice. Um, and then everybody went back to doing what they were doing pretty much. Um, 
because of the manifesto, though, um, people's lives changed, our lives changed. Um, so Andy and myself, for example, uh, started doing a lot more conference talking. Um, people, you know, we were doing some talking based on the pragmatic programmer. That's Andy Hunt. Andy Hunt, yeah. Right. But then um, we also got involved with, initially at least, talking about what this Agile Manifesto meant. Um, and I personally got pretty tired of that pretty quickly um, because uh, there's a quote often attributed, well, I can't remember, lots of different people, uh, that goes something like, writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Um, <laughs> and I kind of feel the same way. Talking about agility is kind of pointless. Um, so I kind of stopped doing it um, and pulled back from, you know, the, the Agile Alliance and that kind of stuff. I wasn't interested. Uh, a few other people did the same. Uh, other people went like full bore uh, into consulting and training and everything else. Um, and that's fine. That's fine. Um, but yeah, so it, it kind of like as a group, we met we did something and then we kind of exploded apart again. Mm. Um, and I know, um, I think everybody but me got together for the 10th anniversary, um, but it was run by the Agile Alliance and I just wasn't interested. So I, I skipped that, which was probably a bit churlish of me. Um, so that's it. Um, yes, yeah, so that's really, really interesting. I've, I've uh, learned quite a few things about uh, what happened in, at Snowbird uh, from that day. Thank you. I mean, so, so moving into the, the first third of our uh, interview, with that introduction, if, if, if you kind of get up in a helicopter and look down at the software development landscape as it exists today, and particularly software, you know, the services that ordinary users experience, online services, apps, enterprise applications, blah, blah. You look at it all, are you actually happy with what's happened? Or do you look at it and think, oh, what have they done? I, I okay, so I am, um, I'm trying to work out how to say this without sounding like some kind of megalomaniac. Um, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, go on. It's natural. Um, no. <laughs> okay. I think increasingly since the, since, well, maybe since the mid nineties, but most definitely since the manifesto and nothing to do with the manifesto software has become the most significant force for change in the world. Um, imagine the pandemic and we didn't have the internet or we didn't have video conferencing or we didn't have shared documents that we could edit all of these things that really have enabled us to get through that in some semblance of, of normality but not just that imagine you know not being able to buy things online imagine not being able to uh i mean i run um user group meetings in kenya you know and that to me is both a humbling experience but it's an amazing experience you know i'm sitting there talking i'm sitting in my little office here talking to people in nairobi or wherever it is and having really great conversations i couldn't have done that 20 years ago 10 years ago even it's extraordinary. I think the online education space and also uh, telemedicine, as it used to be called a long time ago, oh. uh, but distance medicine and um, also the innovations we're seeing in genomics and, and things like that. Uh, extraordinary, oh. extraordinary um, developments. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, let's talk about economics. I mean, I think economics is an interesting area because it's both good and bad. I mean, the 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 move towards transparency and real-time reporting and all that kind of stuff is, is obviously a good thing, I think, but it also means that we fall foul of 
somewhat out of control optimization. Um, and you know, we have to think really hard about that. Um, what, what do so, you mean by that? I mean, if you just take it the simplest, I mean, the way, um, the way trading is done nowadays, where, you know, companies will pay tens of millions, hundreds of millions to save three milliseconds on the ping times between two servers, you know, just so they can get that information three milliseconds before somebody else. And that's basically gamifying, um, you know, when people turn that into purely a game and there's no actual underlying basis for investment, that's dangerous. Um, so I think the, those are some aspects that are obviously negative, but far and away, the positives outweigh the negatives. So I am really proud to be part of an industry that's doing that. Um, and it's not doing it deliberately necessarily. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, when Twitter first formed, the idea wouldn't wasn't that, hey, we're going to catalyze revolutions, you know, but it did. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, unexpected and normally beneficial consequences to the work we do. And if we were to use the practices that we were using in 1998 in 2021, we wouldn't be doing that. Um, back in 1990s, we were doing things like rational unified process, which was fundamentally kind of like, eh, mostly a kind of waterfall-y kind of thing. Um, we were struggling mightily to develop software. Um, most projects, the vast majority of projects were late or abandoned. Um, and the average lifetime of a piece of software was, you know, like 18 months or something. It was very short. Um, Nowadays, we're not developing great software, we're developing pretty crappy software, but we're developing it faster. We're developing it a bit more in line with what users want um, and more innovation because the tools are available and because it's just so much easier to write software. I mean, I look at the stuff that I put together in an hour and think about how long that would have taken me 20 years ago. I would never have started it. It would have been a month. Yeah. So, you know, I think we, we have come a long, long way. And when you're down in the trenches covered in mud, it's really quite easy to forget just how far we've come, you know? So my overall message is, is way to go, guys. You know, we've done a fantastic job. Um, are we better than we were? Yeah, I think we are. Um, I think if you look back at 2000, vast majority of teams did no automated testing. I would guess the vast majority of teams did not use source control. Um, the vast majority of teams did not think as a team about process. Instead, they just basically, you know, filled in their TPS reports or whatever it was they were given. Um, so post manifesto, well, to be accurate, post five years after Manifesto, when it started to get some traction, I think those things changed and teams started to take a bit more control of what they were doing. Um, they started to do things like testing, uh, source control, sprints, retrospectives, things that helped them get feedback on what they were doing. Um, so I think in general, as an industry, we're doing better than we were before. Um, I think we still have a long, long way to go. Um, and my hope is that sometime in the next 200 years, we will actually have worked it out and we will be able to treat software development about the same way we treat bridge construction nowadays. Um, or I guess more accurately, our new AI overlords will be able to view software construction that way. So, you know, I, I think in general, my, my feeling is that software as an industry has grown up a bit and we're doing better. So, so that, that's a generally a positive message. Um, so let, let me just uh, uh, socialize an idea with you. Um, I mean, in the tech industry, things tend to go in waves. 
markets you know they they they're born they grow they mature they die you know um there, there are sort of trends and waves um you know, it's kind of a, a long-standing feature of the tech industry you know industries get affected by technology they get transformed they get undone they get redone like the music industry like you know, telecoms mm-hmm. broadband all of this so if you think about software development and think how agile has changed software development generally for the better you know we've been we've set in motion this this you know multiple parallel trends as you say all these tools have, have become available to allow people to build things very quickly and efficiently that which would have been impossible in 2001 um is that trend sustainable or are you seeing at the macro level something suggesting that this this trend that was catalyzed by the manifesto and the enabling technologies will have to actually self-correct and move to something else oh most definitely um i mean you're absolutely right things are um i don't know if cyclical is the right word but certainly you know there's a wave like nature to it um and that is fractal so it goes down you know from the most low level up to the overall you know, overarching economics of software development. Um, so you expect to see things rise and fall all the time. The nice thing about agile software is that it doesn't really exist as a thing, right? There isn't like, you can't go down to your local green grocer and buy a pound of agile, please, uh, despite what some people will try and sell you. Um, it is a philosophy. It's a set of values, yeah. And as such, it is probably less uh, susceptible to the fads in the industry than if it was do this, do that. You know, you must achieve ninety-eight percent unit test coverage or whatever it might be. If I look at the values of the manifesto. I don't see anything I would want to change about them. Uh, I think they still hold today. um, And they are likely to continue to hold for some time to come. The problem I see, and this is where we swing from the incredibly positive to the negative. The problem I see is that the implementation is being corrupted so people rather than looking at it as a set of values which they then use to filter their behaviors instead what's happening is people are coming up with this is how you do agile you know and so we're getting increasingly large numbers of agile in a box um, partly because it is a massive multi-billion dollar industry at the moment and people want to jump into that consultancies are very happy to you know send you a 500 euro a day you know project leader who quote does agile um, and they're very happy to do that because they spent a thousand euros the day before sending them on a scrum master course and that's what makes them you know you can now build them out it's not The Vagile, the values in the manifesto, I think, are, yeah, they're cyclical, but I think it's a long cycle. The implementation of those values, though, is definitely on the way down. Um, when you I, say on the way down, do, do, do you mean we've reached peak uh, shrink-wrapped Agile? No, I don't think we've reached peak shrink-wrapped. I think we've reached peak benefit. Um, of Agile. Of... of Okay, you've got to be really careful what you mean by, quote, agile, okay? Like I said... Well, let, let's, that- if, if I may interrupt very briefly, just to sort of, um, to, to make sure I'm not sort of uh, confusing the thing. Uh, there's two very, very different concepts. There's the agile, the manifesto for agile software development and the concepts that, that, are, that, that, that form part of that. Right. And then you have tools, methods, procedures training courses, certification programs, uh, which people have invented with a view to helping ordinary companies 
actually apply these principles. And I think what you're saying is that is that the, the benefit that we're actually able to achieve with the tools that people have got is is peaked out. Okay, so every year in January, sales of diet books must go through the roof. People want to buy a solution in a box. They want to go, okay, I, I'm going to need to lose some weight. I'm going to go spend whatever on three diet books, you know, and then maybe I'll just look at them once, but that'll be enough. And that's the same thing with all of these various quote methodologies that are based around the manifesto. So rather than doing the work, people are trying to buy it in. Um, when I was in, uh, had my own company in England, uh, we got uh, ISO 9001 certified. And the way you're supposed to do that is you, spend, you pay some consultant some ridiculous amount of money to come in, and they basically give you a set of procedures. And you follow those procedures, and uh, you get certified. And the certification guy comes in and basically weighs your documentation and says, yeah, that's heavy enough. We're going to give you ISO 9001. And we thought, well, we're probably actually up to the spec already on what we do. So rather than doing that, we just need to wrote our own. And we wrote about 60 pages of this is how we do things. And the inspector came in and said, okay, so where are your standards? And we gave him the 60 pages. And he said, no, 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 I don't, I want the whole thing. I said, that is the whole thing. And he went through it. And the only thing he found that wasn't up to their spec was something to do with tracking numbers on invoices or something like that. Um, and that's because what we did was we didn't buy in their procedures. We tried to make our procedures compliant and tried to make our procedures work the way they should be. So when you're trying to be, quote, agile, you can't go out and buy a methodology. The entire point of Agile is there are no methodologies. That, that is such a lovely quote. I love that. So, so just to sort of test my own understanding of your, your point, I, th I think what, now what you're saying is um, in order to be Agile, by definition, that means that you do not gravitate to uh, a standard process, a standard tool, a standard framework, unless you believe that that is actually in your best interest I think it's actually slightly more fundamental than that. Um, it's not that you don't gravitate towards. It's that your underlying reason for doing what you're doing is that you want to get better at software development. Hmm. And so what you're doing is you're looking for ways of doing that. Um, and one way of doing that we believe or i believe is to look at the values in the agile manifesto and if you try to filter what you do through the lens of those values then my belief is that over time your software development processes will get better and better and better it is not a one-off thing though you don't like spend a day look at the values, say okay this is how we're going to do it from now on it is a lifelong feedback loop where you're constantly looking at what you're doing and saying what's working, what's not working. Now, if you want to start out and if your heart really is in, I want to become agile, then I would 100% endorse people starting off with something like Scrum and as they take on the practice to look at what they're doing through that feedback lens the whole time. If they are an agile team, then by the end of the first year, what they're doing will no longer be recognizable as Scrum because they will have adopted it and adapted it into their own situation, their own context. And what they need may well be very different to what anybody else needs. 
because nobody else is doing the same project as you. Nobody else is doing the same tooling, the same requirement, the same customer, the same company, all of that, the same teammates even, right? With all of those variety, all that variation in place, it's impossible to imagine two people working on the same, sorry, two people having to work in the same way to write great software. So in your experience, from what you can see with the people that you're interfacing with at the moment in your network and clients and things, what percentage of teams are performing, well, teams that proclaim to be agile, maybe even teams that proclaim to be really good agile teams, what percentage of those are operating at that meta level, do you think? Because you've just actually described a bar, which is, I think, very high. I would think that 100% of teams that describe themselves as agile are not. Wow. But I think that there are maybe 20% of teams out there that are doing a fantastic job with agility. And the reason for that is I think the second a team thinks of itself as an agile team, they've lost. Well, I once gave a talk about perfection and it, it is stunning. If you look for quotes about perfection, you will find everybody from songwriters to philosophers to poets all have the same idea and that is perfection is evil because perfection at its best is stasis and at its worst is inachievable and was it sting said is to look for heaven is to live in hell um it's the you know this idea that you've achieved something it's frightening it's an abomination it means that you don't have to do any more you've stopped you've finished you've reached the peak you know um and I just, that scares me. So a team that says, yeah, we're agile, isn't. A team that says, we're trying to be agile, is. That's a really great insight, isn't it? It's actually, it's quite deep. Yeah, deep in the sense that it goes, it, it actually goes to the root of a lot of problems and a lot of software teams that I've, 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 I've encountered. Um, I don't know what, what your experience is, but I mean, I, I um, myself see quite often very clear and specific examples of where in a scrum team, which is not really doing scrum, I mean, technically scrum is quote immutable, mm. which means by definition, there are no real scrum teams, but putting that to one side, they'll be doing something which is clearly wrong. Um, like putting software into production that's not being properly tested and expecting the customer to do it. Um, like going ahead and putting work into uh, um, an engineering team when no one knows how to test it, which hasn't been thought through. Maybe it's quite complicated to do a full functional test. And people aren't taking action. They have the retrospectives. They know there are problems, but there's some... The team doesn't seem to have the ability, even though it is a scrum team, to meta-analyze its own, to abstract up, look at its own performance objectively and to self-correct when the problems are in plain sight. So that's really interesting because... Do you, do you understand the point? Well, I, I do, but I think I would take issue with the point okay. because you are implicitly here... Um, I mean, for example, you said putting things into production without testing them, letting the customer test them, right? Yep. And in the way you phrased that, that was kind of like a, well, obviously that's the wrong thing to do. Yeah. You know? It's not the wrong thing to do. You don't know it's the wrong thing to do. You only know it's the wrong thing to do if you've tried it and you've looked to see what happens. For example, I bet you that for non-life critical, non-mission critical projects, the average customer would much, much rather see 
80% software, 50% early, right? Then wait around for you guys to finish polishing the last little bit before it goes out, right? But nobody asks. Nobody says, hey, look, this will probably crash if you try and sell a parrot to Madagascar. But for the rest of the stuff, it will probably be okay. Nobody asks whether or not we should try that, right? This, the spirit of agility is, hey, let's see what happens, right? I mean, obviously, you don't do it without telling people. But you go to the customer and you say, hey, you know, here's an idea, crazy, stupid idea. But would you like your software five months early? But it'll have some rough edges, right? If you want to get feedback, what better way is there of getting feedback than doing that? And yeah, it may not be tested or 100% tested. Is that a... I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I was really describing gross problems. Yeah, I know, I understand. But where, where, there are, where there are significant commercial implications and, and there's going to be a big user problem. I mean... You know, I, there's a lot of, I think you, we were talking earlier and, you know, you said there's a lot of pretty crappy software out there, but it's a lot easier to produce it now than it used to be. Um, and it has more functionality and it's on average better serving user needs. But, you know, um, sometimes you can push it too far, don't you think? Or maybe not. Yeah, but the thing is, you don't know you've pushed it too far until you push it too far. That's... Um, there's a really great book. Oh, I can't remember who wrote it on engineering bridges. And it analyzes, um, uh, Petros is it Petrosky? Maybe. Um, analyzes the history of bridge building. And fundamentally, what happens is you, you have existing engineering techniques and you apply those. And the my definition of engineering basically is building something that works as cheaply as possible. Um, because anybody could build a bridge by dumping, you know, a small planet's worth of concrete across a river. But what you want to do is to do it, you know, better. So if you look at very early bridges, they were fundamentally just slabs, you know, logs laid across a river or whatever else. When that wasn't enough, you would put a central support in. And at some point, someone discovered the arch and suddenly we could build using less materials and get the same strength. So what happens then? People build bigger and bigger arch bridges using less and less material. And at some point the bridge falls down and they go, oops, we just took it a bit too far. And they back back up again, right? And then someone invents a new technique and exactly the same thing happens. Same thing happened with suspension bridges. Mm. You know, and they got thinner and taller until one of them oscillated itself to death. Um, that's the way engineering, real engineering works, right? Engineering is not, we know the answers. It's, we know the parameters. And that's what we need to be doing in software too. And that's what we are doing to a large extent, but sometimes it's not consciously, right? So the idea of, you know, there are certain things, okay, like testing in general, right? I hate the cult of testing that has grown up in the last 10 years, where testing has become like a, um, you know, a status thing almost. So people will say, well, if you haven't got unit tests for that, I'm not going to accept it. Or... Is it got 100% coverage? No, well, that's not good. You know, I'm not interested. Um, and by, testing, by testing, when I was using the word testing, I was talking about end user feedback. I, yeah, it doesn't matter. All I'm saying is, okay. is, is people have latched onto things that are kind of like, they're cargo culting. They're, they're taking stuff that you know, they believe to be good and they're making it into a religion. Um, and all I'm saying is, let's, let's break that down, right? So when people make statements like, you know, oh, these, these poor teams are delivering software without testing it, then, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. If I had a pacemaker that no one had tested the software for, I would be pretty upset. Um, but 
if I had a, I don't know, well, <laughs> half the software I use every day clearly has never been tested before it was put into production, you know, and 90% of the time it works okay. And it gets me through my day. And if I had to wait for that software another two years, I'd take the hit. I'd, I'd take it as it is today. So all I'm saying is don't assume, don't, don't ha ever have rules about stuff, even if it appears to be common sense, right? Try not to have those rules and instead try to explore them, right? Rules are not meant to be broken, but they are meant to be tested. So just building on the point that we you were making about, you know, um, uh, agility, the, the idea of the notion of agility and looking at the testing point, so I'm trying to sort of understand exactly what you're saying um, and just checking I'm not completely <laughs> out of alignment with you. I don't think so. Um, pick a software project in your, in your own mind's eye. I, I think what you're saying is that on the subject of testing, if the team thinks, taking into account business drivers and end user, whatever, um, requirements, that it doesn't need to do much testing, that's actually okay. I'm saying if it doesn't think it needs to do testing, then what it should do is devise an experiment to see if that's true or not. So I quite often talk to teams and they are really proud of the fact they have 100% test coverage. So I said, oh, that sounds good. That's a nice, easy number to remember. How much does that cost you? And they don't know. So I propose an experiment. Okay, I said, okay, first thing I say is, why do you test? And they look at me like I'm an idiot and say, well, we got to make sure that there's no bugs, um, which is exactly not why you test. But so I say, okay, so let's say the bugs then are your critical factor. So what is your current bug rate, right? I don't care how you measure it. Bugs per thousand lines of code, bugs per day, whatever it might be, right? What's your current error rate? And they can work out some number. If not, then I send them back to school. But assuming they actually know that number, I said, okay, so now dial back, go back to 90% test coverage, right? Ignore the 10% that are really, really expensive or hard to test. Do that for a month and look at your bug rate afterwards. Now, if your bug rate has doubled, then I say, go back. You now know that you actually need to be at something closer to 100% than 90%. If your bug rate stays the same, then I've just saved you five days a month on trying to get that extra 10%. That's that really hard 10% to fix. What I'm saying is don't do things until you know how to measure whether or not they're better or worse. Yeah. Okay. I got it. Okay. Right. And I think quite often people are amazed when common sense basically breaks down in the face of evidence. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so to condition that it's, if the team thinks it's okay, um, they need to have some uh, data or test or a validation yep. method to, 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 to base that decision on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yep. So there could, there could be, for, for example, you know, okay, this is a mobile app. We've got only got 500,000 users. We've got, um, we've managed to recruit, you know, 150 users that we're paying carefully pick, paying to test early features, and we're going to see what happens if we start rolling the stuff out with only a 80% test coverage. And if they mm -hmm. don't complain, if they don't complain, then that's probably okay. I would say actually for the average app, which is um, not life critical, I wouldn't necessarily bother with A/B testing at that level. Because, you know, if, if you're in the middle of online shopping and you have to hit reload on a page, all right, you do it, all right? It's not like, you know, you're not going to go and change vendors just because a page happens to hang. So I wouldn't necessarily even A-B test it. I would just like change it, go out there, see what happens, all right?
And if your bug rate goes up by 2% in a month, I don't think that's going to cost your business anything. I mean, maybe it would, maybe I'm wrong. And in which, in which case, yes, A, B, test it and everything else. Yeah. But um, I mean, particularly if you're paying a select group of customers to test, then you're guaranteeing that that test is going to be skewed. So I'm not too sure that's a, a great idea. I, I, you know, I, I am all for doing the simplest, right? And for me, the simplest is, hey, let's just try it. See what happens. So you know, what's, what specific we were talking about, about testing, quite a bit about testing. What part of the manifesto, sorry, the manifesto for agile software development, um, do you think testing maps onto? I'm working mainly at the first page. It maps on, okay, so the intent is that it maps on to ease of change. Because it's, in theory, easier to change. And this, to some extent, comes from XP. So the idea of software that can be developed quickly and changed quickly, responsive to user requirement, is uh, testing is kind of like a substrate on which that can happen. Um, so it serves two purposes, I think. Uh, one purpose is uh, regression. It allows you to make changes and make sure you haven't broken anything. But I think there's a far more fundamental reason to test. And that is, if you know that you're going to test code, then you're going to structure that code to make it testable. And everybody knows that if you're sitting there trying to test one little function in the middle of a complex system, and it requires 20, 50 lines of code to set up the environment, so that function can be tested, then what you know you is you've got yourself a badly designed system. And so uh, the drive to do testing is a way of improving your design and making your design more flexible, more decoupled. Um, and that makes your software easier to change. So I think that's where testing fits in. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a way of developing software that you feel more comfortable changing. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Is there anything else that you think has gone wrong or is going wrong, apart from those two specific things? This idea of, you know, um, implementation is, you know, people are buying Agile in, they're not applying the correct level of judgment when it comes to testing. Those are just like, you know, you just happen to hit a couple of hot buttons there. I mean, there are, testing is just one of many areas that people are, uh, unhealthily focusing on, let's put it that way. Um, but I think if you were looking at the big picture, the big picture, um, agility is a bottom-up concept. It starts with individual developers and you don't have to be in a company that's embraced the manifesto to do this. Individual developers can apply the values of the manifesto to what they do on a minute by minute basis, a day by day basis, and on a career basis, you know? Um, and that is effective. That makes a difference to those people and likely to the teams that those people are on. Um, from there, what might happen is if individual developers, uh, live those values other people may see them doing that and ask okay so how come you're doing that or why is that so fast for you you know how come you know that when nobody else does whatever and they can explain what they're doing and why they're doing it they don't have to say oh read the agile manifesto they just say well you know before i started doing this i said to myself how am i going to know when i'm done you know, and so I actually wrote down just a couple of ideas on what this is going to do when it's finished. And I used those to write a couple of tests and that let me, you know, aim for something. And then it was finished. I moved on. And if you do that kind of thing, then you can spread through some kind of osmosis, this idea into other people on the team. And you don't necessarily have a team at that point that has, you know, adheres to the manifesto, but you've got a group of people mm. and then maybe that can grow up and grow up. There comes a point, though, where that kind of stops. And it stops because the entire the ability to do things in rapid cycles and gather feedback relies on 
you being in an environment that supports that. So if your environment is yearly budget meetings and you know you have to commit to project timescales you know before January the 1st because that's how the budgets get set, uh, you're going to struggle to make that a universal practice in your company. Uh, so there comes a point at which you as a an individual or as a team are going to have to compromise. And that's where project management comes into it. Um, I think project managers' jobs in the, quote, agile world is nothing to do with running the project. It's running interference for the project is what a manager is supposed to do. So um, going back to communication days, your, your project manager is a way of dealing with impedance mismatch between the team and the environment that the team is in. Um, and that is my, my recipe for implementing the values is, is just that, is to go bottom up and to let it grow as it grows in your environment and don't try and force it into a box. Um, that project manager role, I, I can see people might get a little bit um, confused about that. It, it, this idea of intermediating between the team and the organization, is that not the scrum master role? What is a scrum master? Is a scrum master somebody who's done the two days? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've worked with quite a lot of scrum masters and about 20% of them are excellent and the rest of them don't have much value. Right. Anyone and watching this now, I apologize. And I'm sorry for saying that, um, but that's my personal experience. And it's only when you've worked with a really good one that you know the difference. Yeah, I don't know if it's the same everywhere, but in the States now, kids who participate in things like, or anything, any kind of, quote, competitive event, whether it's baseball or chess or whatever, everybody gets a medal, right? You get a medal for participating. Um, and to a point, yeah, I think you should do, because I think it's great that you actually got off your backside, stopped watching cartoons and went out there and did something. So that's good. But I think I view the people who have their scrum masters to figure up on their walls. That's like a participation medal. It doesn't really say much. Um, I would guess that the 20% of people you thought were really good would have been really good if they hadn't got a scrum master certification, right? I think that they are... They know what they're doing. They're mature. They're good developers or good managers or whatever else. And, and yes, oh, by the way, you know, they know what, you know, a sprint is or whatever else. Yeah. You know? So I think a manager's role is not defined by any kind of set set of procedures. It's not defined by a project management structure. It's defined dynamically by the need of that time. A project manager's role is to try and maximize the likelihood of the project being viewed as having a successful outcome. And I'm fairly careful about the way I worded that. I didn't say the project has a successful outcome. I said the project is viewed as having a successful outcome. Yeah. Because ultimately that's the most important thing. So, this gets us onto something which is uh, interesting, uh, and I was talking to Jim Clapeen about this um, last week. Um, the P word, the project word. So um, it is mentioned twice in the Agile Manifesto. I've got it here on, um, sorry, the principles behind the Agile Manifesto. Um, but my experience again is that the, the P word is regarded as a bit of a dirty word because it brings with it the idea of waterfall, it brings with it the idea of documentation, it brings with it the idea of process. And um, there's some sort of, uh, sort of yuck factor associated with those words. Um, and I, I'm just curious to know because I know that Steve Miller was involved in 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 the, in at Snowbird, and he's he's a waterfall guy, right? 
And I'm curious to know what involvement this sort of project related um, stuff had at Snowbird and how you see it mapping onto the agile landscape today. Yeah, I think I don't share your connotations when it comes to the word project. Um, I'm, I'm being provocative. They're not my personal ones. I'm just... Okay, two things. First of all, for me, project doesn't necessarily flag people who are doing waterfall or excessive documentation or anything like that. Project to me is just an economic unit. Um, you know, typically it will be a cost center or something. Um, and that's necessary. Um, I also don't think waterfall is bad. Um, first of all, there's two kinds of waterfall. There's, there's de facto waterfall, which is we write the documentation up front and then we implement the software. Um, but there's actually real waterfall. If you actually have a look at the real uh, definitions of waterfall, the original papers, it's all about feedback right? at every step you can go back to the previous step to correct, to correct things. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you could actually fit waterfall that way into, um, you could fit a whole bunch of small waterfalls into uh, a project that I would say followed the agile values. Uh, that, would be, that would be perfectly good. Similarly, documentation, uh, there are times when documentation is the project, you know, and the software is kind of incidental. Um, there are times when you can be clever with the documentation and uh, the documentation could be the tests, for example. So I'm not against that either. Like I said, if I was having a pacemaker fitted or if I was an astronaut in a, in a rocket, I would feel very happy if I knew that my software had been through a very rigorous set of steps to get where it was. And people were not adding changes at the last minute just because they can. So I think, again, it's all contextual, you know? I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with calling something a project because as long as your project goal is definable in a kind of flexible way, it's perfectly good with me. I have another question related to all of this. We're really describing something here, you're articulating, I should say, something which is, I think, pretty easy to understand, makes perfect sense. We're talking about people that have got experience, they've got judgment, they can adapt, they can change, they're, they're mature, they know how to interface with the environment, they know how to apply the concept of testing to their situation as the situation demands it, not just following some set mm -hmm. of rules they've got off the internet. So all of that. now. My, my thesis, again, to test the thinking, is this requires experienced people, um, or at least enough experienced people on the team that have actually made mistakes in the past, that have seen things go wrong, that have had success, and that have perhaps, you could argue, the maturity to apply a bit of judgment and help the younger ones coming along. So the question is, do, do you think that teams have that level of experience, or are we expecting them to, 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 to apply this agility concept and they don't really have the experience or ability to do it. Is, that our, is that our expectation of them too high? So it's a number of ways of attacking that. Um, and I'm actually gonna drop down a question for myself here. Okay, let's come back, first of all, to the idea of experience and knowing. Um, I don't know if this is true or not, uh, but my son did uh, karate for a time. And his instructor used to tell a tale that, you, you know, you go through the belt ranks and uh, the, uh, the, the highest kind of like the end of the line training is to get a black belt. Right? And then they all say, oh, the black belt, that's when you actually start to learn, right? You've got, now you develop all the techniques, now you're actually going to learn. But the story they used to back that up is... Um, you are never, with any of the belts, you're never supposed to wash a belt, right? It's always supposed to be, uh, the belt encapsulates the sweat that you put into getting that far. Oh. 
with a. Is that true, by the way? Just yeah, you're not you're not supposed you're not supposed to wash your your belt. Didn't know that. But another reason you're not supposed to wash it is that a black belt it's just a white belt that's been dyed black. Yeah. Over time, the belt color fades, and it fades because the sweat that goes into it draws out the dye. And if you look at a very experienced black belt, their belt will be gray. And the more experienced they are, the grayer it gets. And they say, and this is kind of like the old Zen master business, right? But the ultimate black belt or the ultimate master is when their belt becomes white again. And they have accepted that they're a beginner. Oh. Yeah. The that's a lovely that's a lovely idea actually. I can see I can see how that applies to software. Yeah. And I think the same is true. I think the idea that experienced people know how to run projects, yeah, they actually have good reflexes compared to inexperienced people, but they also have bad reflexes that are developed along the way. You know, you can't do that. Well, why not? It's human nature. I mean, we all have learned stuff that works for us, right? And it's just natural to take that as being the way the world works. You know, when I'm teaching, I love teaching beginners uh, because that's when I learn the most. Because beginners are really, really good at saying why. Yeah. And so I'll say, I think you should indent that line. And they say, why? And it forces me to stop and articulate what has become a reflex. Yeah. yeah? And I have to dig into it and think, ah, oh, that's because of this, you know, whatever it might be. And every now and then they'll say, why? And I will be able to come up with a real reason, you know? And I've, I will have realized that I was doing something that I used to do 20 years ago for a good reason, but doesn't apply anymore, you know? So I think beginners, if they're treated with respect, are a great source of wisdom for a team. Um, at the same time, obviously, a beginner doesn't have experience, and you're going to have to tell them a lot of stuff. So there's an interesting balance here. When you're a beginner, you need to be told. You don't experiment. You don't find out for yourself. You have to be told because you don't have any context in which to make decisions. You don't know what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong. You just need to be told. And by encouraging them to us why, not only are they learning, but you're learning as well. Do you think we have enough of, of, of the, right, the, right, the right balance out there at the moment? I know some projects do. Um, and I think that pretty much guarantees that some projects don't. I think there is actually one, one area where I think we could definitely do better and fix some of that. And that is, there is an implicit ageism in software development that typically it's viewed as being, you know, a young person's sport that um, there's no way, you know, some, you know, wrinkly old 35 year old is going to be able to write Redux software or whatever. Um, and I think that's a big shame. Where is that coming from? I think maybe it's just, you know, rebellion against your parents or something. I have no idea, but yeah, it's, it's, it is a problem. You quite often see all the developers, good ones, being kind of shuffled to the side of it, you know, because they're not as rock and rolly as their their younger co-workers. Do you, do you think that's because I mean, cards on the table? I mean, I'm I'm not a spring chicken. You can tell by the color of my hair, right? I, th I thought you dyed it. <laughs> I was I was. Some people have said that I should do that. In fact, <laughs> yeah, seriously. But I say I'm not. I'm not doing that. The question is really the older ones, and it, it's not just engineering people, it's QA people, it's product people, it's marketing people, it's anyone who's involved in the tech space who's, you know, over, over 40, 50, you've had it. Is that because the tools and frameworks and methods and technology is moving so fast and the ones that are in their 20s just really don't think these older guys or gals 
have got the intellectual agility to keep up, is it, is it their perception or is it actually true that there's actually a, a competence problem with the older ones? It's a question. I don't have an opinion. I think... I think... Is it perception or reality? Okay, so I think it's reality in many situations. So I have programmed pretty much every day for the last 47 years. Wow. And I make it a point to try to keep current. And it's very, very difficult to do that because our, our technological horizon is expanding exponentially right it's getting broader and basically it's like a it's like a balloon that's expanding and expanding well the surface area is going up you know with the whatever the square of the radius because you know things are building on other things are building on other things um so that makes it very very hard to keep up with quote everything um the younger developers who have learned the ins and outs of one particular technology one particular framework will view the, you know, the older ones who have an inkling of it, but aren't, you know, like totally bedded into it with, you know, some derision because yeah, they don't know every single API or whatever else that might be in there. But what they're forgetting is what their framework does is not unique. It's been done before and it's been done many times before. And someone with 20 years experience will have seen it being done 20 years before in different ways. And they will be able to say, oh, that's really interesting. Um, just be warned, though, that that could lead to deadlock because of this or whatever it might be. That experience is a really hard one, and it's uh, really valuable. So I think that if I was a young person in the industry, I would look to, I would hope to look beyond specific knowledge of current latest fad and instead work out how to integrate the experience of my older team members into that. If I was an older team member, I would do kind of the opposite. And that is a lot of people get to a point. Well, first of all, I think you have to decide for yourself what, what path you're going to take in the industry. I mean, the traditional path is you code like hell for, you know, 15 years, and then you move into management, you know, and that's why we have a whole bunch of really crappy software managers. Um, some people, though, are good at programming and they like programming. Me, for example, I enjoy programming. Um, and so I want to choose a career path that will let me continue to program. Now, if I was a, a plumber or an electrician or a doctor, then in order to keep being a plumber or an electrician or a doctor, I have to go and do training. I have to annually go out and learn the new things that's right um and i think that's just an overhead of doing business you know so if you're a developer you have to accept the fact that you have to keep yourself where you want to be right if where you want to be is writing software then the software that gets written is changing and you need to change to be there with it and that means that you have to commit to yourself okay i'm going to learn this framework. I'm going to learn this language. I'm going to learn this technique, whatever it might be. I'm going to learn this industry, right? And you do it on your own time because the person you're investing in is you. It's not your company's job to do it. It's not any kind of industry job. It's your job because that's what you want to do. I've got another question. It will take a little, a few, a little bit to set it up. Uh, it's quite a fundamental question, um, quite deep. So as the technology industry, technology industries developed and the software's grown and developed, we've had these layers of abstraction added. Tools, frameworks, mm -hmm. abstraction layers. We have now um, people working at the abstracted level who have no need, putting to one side the special case where you're trying to push the technical envelope, they've got no need to get down to the bare metal. Right. They just don't have a need. They they can do all what they want at the abstracted level. I was talking to um, a tech lead at a previous company I was working at, and she showed me a um, I don't even know what it was. It was a, a screenshot of some Kubernetes configuration panel, 
And all it was was just a bunch of numbers with sliders. She had no clue. I asked her what the numbers meant. There were no units on the on the on the sliders. And she said, Oh, I just fiddle with the numbers until it works. You know, I just add some more, reduce some more. You know, I've got some tests I run. I, I've no idea what it's doing. The punchline, the yeah. punchline, going back to what you were saying about AI, is is that layer going to be automated? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. That layer, 100%. Because if what she's doing is, quote, making it work, well, then, you know, any off-the-shelf AI could do that better. You know, that's, yeah, that's a no-brainer. Um, I thought you were going somewhere different with the question. I thought you were going about whether or not we need to know what the hardware does. Um, I, oh, right. Okay, that's another dimension. Leibniz. Right, there, there you go. A German for you. I think he was German or Austrian. Um, it is unworthy of excellent men to lose hours like slaves in the labor of calculation. If you can automate it, do it. Right? I, for one, am so looking forward to cars that drive themselves. Me too. You know, I am looking forward to, you know, I mean, even like my home network. Right? In the old days, when I had like Wi Fi routers, I was constantly having to twiddle all the parameters to try and get just that bit better coverage in the bathroom, you know? And now I've got these routers that talk to each other and optimize their own network. They hand off people between themselves. They notice that someone's moving and they will actually direct a beam towards that person and do these things that no way could I ever do, right? They're, they are, they have outstripped what I can do. Um, uh, compilers, modern uh, things like C compilers write better code than people could hand code an assembler. They can handle the optimization problem way, way better than individual human beings could do it. And so compiled code typically runs faster than code written in assembler by a human. All of these reasons, yes, automate it, automate it, make use of those tools, right? Um, embrace those tools. But not at the expense of abdicating from the responsibility of knowing what they're doing, right? If you use a tool, then you are responsible for what that tool does. And so you have to, I guess it's trust and verify. You know, you have to be sure that you understand what that tool is doing and why it's doing it. I, I, I completely agree, but, but, but just to sort of develop the point a bit, um, there are many software businesses. Um, I was talking to one quite recently. Um, they have a, a software tool that helps photographers upload their photos so that their customers can create an account pick the photos they want, order the photos they want, in the size they want, um, with the framing they want and have it all delivered. So the photographer's job is focused on the, the photography. Mm -hmm. not, right. That company is, is a successful company. Um, they have no need for any, any people who are really technically deep, who have an understanding of the bare metal. I'm not saying that's good or bad, just observing the reality of it. So let's say the uh, EU changes, or say this UK, this ridiculous UK taxing thing now where every transaction has to get logged, right? So they want to do business in the UK. And so they have to change their backend so that it logs all of these sales, right? Then that's a software change. How do they know if that's possible or not? I'm not saying they don't have technical people. Um, but, but they can solve that problem within the context of, of the software um, stack they have, which has all the... All oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yes, yes, largely. They don't need to, for example, code up a, a proprietary um, computer vision algorithm, you know, uh, which is trying to do something that no one's done before, um, process images, you know... No. 10 times. Yeah. 
as, as fast as Google can do it. They don't need to do anything like that. So they don't have the, the you know, what you and I were having a conversation about microcontrollers and embedded systems and, and all of that sort of stuff. They're not, not at that level. And the question is, I have a, th a feeling, and maybe it's wrong, I'd love to know what you think, that this deep stuff is for the most part being absorbed into the Amazons and the Googles and the Apples and the Microsofts and the Samsungs in the world. And what would be, the software development's being hollowed out and we don't have the tech depth um, in the way that we would have done, um, you know, in, in sort of uh, days of the um, Agile Manifesto. One could argue it's it's just a thesis. What, what do you think? I think, well, back in the, I guess in the 18th century, it was possible to claim with some degree of credibility that you knew a little bit of everything that it was to know, you know, or maybe limit that to science or something. But, you know, the amount of knowledge out there was tractable. When I first started doing software development, it was probably possible to know the vast majority of what was software. Now that is not possible. Right? There was just too much and it's too deep that you need PhDs to understand a lot of what's going on. And I'm cool with that. I'm happy with that. But if your company was, say, okay, so they're not using an AI right now. Great. Then there's no reason for them to write their own AI. But say they did decide, hey, it'd be really nice to build in some face recognition to this. Right? Well, I think they have a responsibility at least to research how that face recognition works. Now, I'm not talking down to the you know, convolution level. I'm talking about you know, what steps does it go through? And more importantly, what kind of mistakes can it make? Right? What kind of issues can I get into? Can I, for example, find a wife's picture of a husband? Sorry, a wife finding a picture of a husband with some other woman because I did face recognition across different customers or whatever it might be, right? All of those issues, I think you need to understand. You cannot just wash your hands and say, oh, the technology does that. That's not my problem, right? So you have to be aware of the implications of what you're doing and the technologies you're using mm. be before you can use them. Otherwise, it's kind of like, you know, it's a kind of weird variant of the Nuremberg defense, isn't it? You know? It is. It is. That, that's a great point. I, I, I completely agree. Um, uh, so before we move to the final and last segment, we will talk about sort of way forward and things. Uh, I just want to, if I, if I may, go back and uh, ask you to perhaps list, perhaps uh, paraphrase briefly. Um, you said, oh, I have a list of things in addition to testing that I've got a problem with. Um, maybe you could just give us a couple of other points oh dear let me preface this by saying again i am very proud of where we've got to and it's an amazing achievement what we've done so a lot of what i'm doing here is kind of either niggly or fine tuning as opposed to you know gross changes so i am very much down on cults of any kind uh, anytime something becomes that's the way we do it, then I can pretty much guarantee that no, it's not. And that may be testing. It may be different deployment strategies. It may be the language you use or the framework you use. I, I really, really dislike the way people jump onto libraries and then convolve their code to work with the library, particularly as if it wasn't for open source, you know, I wouldn't be talking to you. Uh, but a lot of the open source projects in a kind of more business world came about because of specific projects that worked and they kind of uh, spawned off some of that project. Uh, Ruby on Rails is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Rails is a fantastic platform if you want to write a kind of 
cruddy uh, CMS-like system. Yeah? Mm. But then people have to adapt that to being, okay, I'm going to write a real-time whatever in it. And I said, no, no. Just because that's popular. Which leads me to my second pet peeve. And that is the reason that people are cultists is because they're cowards. Mm. Um, and I think as an industry, people tend to keep their heads down. Um, they'll go along with the flow. They'll say yes when they really think no. They will adopt things because that's what everybody else does. Um, and that is a shame for two reasons. First of all, a shame it's non-optimal for the industry, but also from that individual's point of view, it kind of devalues their life a bit, don't you think? That they are not living their own decisions. I, I Going to the uh, manifesto for agile software development, it, it does say um, individual, individuals and interactions over... Um, processes and tools right i'd like your opinion on this I, i'm seeing we're at tool overload oh absolutely absolutely uh, is it an example in the on the product space the first thing people do when they are faced with the problem is oh i, I need it i need a tool mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. product manager I've, I've got to build a roadmap oh my god i've got to build a roadmap oh I, I need to use this tool or that tool and now i've got a roadmap and actually look at the what they've got it's just a list of milestones it doesn't tell me anything about what they're doing right right do you do you think this is a problem or oh my god yes yeah and not only is it a problem it's a disaster um because tools effectively become your hands after a while right i mean they change the way you do things uh my wife Okay, so my wife is into quilting in a major way. And here in there's a local quilt guild where they get together and talk about quilting. And it's actually a fairly big organization and they got a fairly decent amount of money lying around. And they had a treasurer. Well, they had a series of treasurers. And at one point, the treasurer said, I know, we need to get some accounting software. So they went out and they got QuickBooks, which is kind of like small medium business accounting software but non-trivial right it's yeah. double in, double entry bookkeeping you got to understand what a journal is you got to understand all the various ledgers you got to work out taxable versus non-taxable encodings blah 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 right yeah. they had the faintest clue right and so their accounts now are effectively an incredibly expensive random number generator right they literally have no <laughs> idea and she took over as treasurer. And the first thing she did was delete everything from the QuickBooks. And she's just using a really simple spreadsheet because the number of transactions they have a year is like, you know, a hundred. So it's really straightforward, very simple. Why are we using this really complicated tool to do something? Similarly, I don't know if you've written any JavaScript code recently, but it's pretty much impossible to write any JavaScript project that has less than a thousand dependencies. And that's not exaggeration. I mean, that's literal. And a lot of that is because somebody needed a bit of code that would say, I don't know, convert numbers between bases, for example, right? And so they would find a library that was called uh, arithmetic conversions lib or something. And they would drag that in. And that arithmetic conversions lib would contain, oh, I don't know, a thousand really, really useful functions of which they needed one, which was two lines of code. Yeah. Um, but no, they'll drag it in. But oh, guess what? That then drags in another 50 dependencies because it needs to have, you know, sort of, I don't know, Euler functions or something, right? So, and it gets worse and worse and worse. So the more you rely on these tools, not only the less connected you are to what you're doing, but also the bigger the load you're carrying yeah. around with you all the time i find python's like that i mean uh, python is constantly import something else something and just have about whole, at the top of your stuff you get all this but each of these library components you might only use one function 
Oh, and the worst thing about that is to me, it doesn't matter if it's Python or JavaScript, the chances of actually being able to install a year from now, that project again, cleanly, are zero. Yeah, that's so true. That is such a good point. Yeah. You know, so the more the more dependencies you have, the less flexible you are. Yeah. So and that goes for tooling, it goes for libraries, it goes for everything. Right. Mm. So so no, I am not a big fan of over tooling. I think if you have if you work out what it is that you need to be able to do, mm. and then find something that does that, it may not be perfect, but if it's convenient, lightweight, and it does the job, use it. So like um, when Andy and I were uh, doing the second edition of Pragmatic Programmer, we needed to keep track of all of the um, different tips in the book uh, because every single tip got changed. Some of them got rewritten, some of them got deleted, some got added. And so we set up um, a basically a, a mini Kanban board in, I think we just used GitHub, the little GitHub project thing. And... All it was was a card for each chapter that we moved between columns. So it would be like, Andy is writing, Dave is reviewing, different columns, right? And when Andy finished writing, he would move the card into the Dave is reviewing column, you know? And it what, was it ideal? No, but it saved our butt, you know? It was simple, got the job done. And I think that's what we're forgetting, right? We're looking for the perfect tool. And again, it comes down to courage because it's like the old thing. Nobody ever got fired for buying IBM, right? In the old days, they said IBM was a safe decision because if it was the wrong decision, it was the right decision, you know? And it's kind of like nowadays, it's, you know, no project goes wrong if the project manager decides to use Jira or whatever it might be, you know? Let's imagine, I'm just making up a scenario. We've got some service... Got a, got a website, just been stuck into some user testing situation. You're getting some bugs, issues coming up. There's a drop down menu on it, some user entry form. And there's a load of uh, things in this drop down, but the, the text is actually too long. So you, it's truncated, you can't see it all. Right? right. Someone's reported, oh, I can't see the text. You've got, you've got to make the drop down wider. Let me guess, this is a German application. <laughs> No, no, it's not actually. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> this, this, is a real, this is a real example, but it's not Germany. Okay. Anyway, so we have a bug report. It goes into JIRA. So the person, the BA, has got to actually take screenshots of this. Particular, there are three different sorts of drop down depending upon what options you select. So we've got three screenshots that have to hand annotate, explaining what's going on. They've got to actually put some copy of the actual text into the Jira tickets, they've actually spent, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, three hours writing this ticket. Yep. It takes about, if you're really slow, 10 minutes to fix that. Yep. Is that okay or has that gone wrong? It depends on your environment. If, for example, you could just go over, pick up one of the developers by the collar, drag them in front of the screen, show them the problem, and they go, oh, I'll fix that, go back and fix it. And if that worked reliably, that's all you need, in my opinion. But if you've tried that and developers forget to make the change, then maybe they, maybe you have to go back to a Jira route or whatever it might be, you know? But it's there is no one size. And again, it depends on the circumstances. Personally, my rule is always simplify, simplify, simplify until it goes wrong. Mm. And then, then come back one step. You know, so in that, you know, so if, if I was doing that, I would say, okay, I would ask, first of all, where are the developers at this point, right? Are they co-located with the testing? Are they on a different planet? Wherever they are, right? And then I would say, okay, how am I best going to communicate this problem to a developer in such a way that it doesn't get lost, that I can track that it's been fixed, and I can actually go back and verify that it's been fixed. Right. right? And, you know. Maybe I can do that with a whiteboard. Maybe I can do it with Jira. Whatever it is, you know. That's a great answer. Thank you for that. Okay, so finally, in the final segment, you know, having gone through all that, we've got some things that are good 
and some things that you definitely don't like. Do you think there are specific things that could be done, actions that could be taken to improve? Let me, let me give you one that I believe very strongly. I believe we should abolish undergraduate computer science education. Right, so nothing, nothing major at all then? No. I think that we should replace... Until, until there is a genuine scientific basis to doing what we do, we should replace computer science with apprenticeship. That's a really interesting idea. The, if you look at the average computer science course, and, I'm, and I know that there are exceptions to this, um, so like the Caltech course, the MIT course, I don't know any European ones, but uh, are not this way. But 99% of computer science university courses are trade schools, right? They are teaching you to get employed at the end. Good for them. But let's make it a trade school. It's not a university. Let's make it proper. We'll do uh, my ideal entry into software is you spend three months at some kind of boot camp whose intention is not to turn you into the world's best Rails developer, but instead to give you the basics on data structures and you know basically what code is, what version control is, blah, blah. Then you go into a proper apprenticeship scheme, which doesn't mean you become the junior team member who has to do all the testing and makes the coffee, but it's actually a genuine apprenticeship scheme where there is a... Uh, set of skills that you are expected to master and where you test out of it with your masterpiece, you know, where you actually have to do something to prove that you've learned these skills. And that then gets you to the, the level of journeyman programmer and you are free to go out on the road and apply your skills. Um, and at that point, after you've got three, four years of industry experience under your belt. And only at that point, if you want to, you can then go to university. Because only then do you actually understand the issues that mm. all of these weird things in university are trying to address. I, th I think what you're saying, to, to do actual computer science these days, you already need a lot of, well, tool fluency and basic competence to to actually even understand the topic and how to do experiments and how to do tests and how to do some mm. analysis and do a research project um and what they're trying and, to do is do all in one program right and most people to be fair don't require to do their jobs don't require that right i mean if you're not doing ai then you can skip a whole bunch of the linear algebra stuff that you'd have to learn otherwise you know it's it's um, we have become specialized, you know, but what hasn't changed is the basis of how to work in a team and how to get stuff done. So let's teach people that the best way, which is on the job. So that's, that's an apprenticeship. Um, do you, do you, do you feel uh, that there's a sort of growing feeling in your sort of orbit that that sort of initiative is, is increasingly needed? When you mention it, everybody goes, yeah, that's a good idea. I don't necessarily think it's going to get implemented. Right, 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 right. Um, that's a really, really interesting point. Um, so that's one thing we can do. Um, anything else you think that you can specifically identify that, you know, is, is clear and focused that people would immediately understand and could say, yeah, I can, I can see that would make a, would move the needle. Yeah, again, to do with education. I would like to see a better educated public when it comes to understanding the limitations and possibilities of software. Because right now, software is treated as a black box. There's no understanding of what's going on, how it's working, and more importantly, how it could be dangerous. So I would like to see a better grasp of stuff that we take for granted the fact that computers talk to each other and can exchange information and the kind of ways that they can co uh, coordinate that and um, consolidate that 
people don't understand. And I think we need to, to be better at explaining that. And legislators need to be better at understanding that before they write legislation. I mean, right now, and I hate to say it, particularly in Europe, mm -hmm. legislators are writing legislation. It's as if they were telling brain surgeons which scalpels to use, you know? Are you referring to the uh, recent stuff on AI? Well, the AI stuff, which is kind of like, eh, and then before that, there was all of the uh, privacy stuff mm. and the cookie stuff. It's just, the whole thing is just pointless. I mean, but I am all for regulation of AI. I mean, I think that uh, it is not inconceivable that we could shoot ourselves in the foot seriously badly with a bit of AI. Um, I think there is a less dramatic but all equally important uh, side of AI with things like self-driving cars, right? How can you verify AI in that context? And there are things that people, to my knowledge, haven't discussed at the uh, regulatory level. They should. Like, if an AI decides to uh, swerve to avoid hitting a baby in a pram, and kills another pedestrian instead, right? Whose fault is that? Is there a fault? You know, all of those kind of decisions have to be made. And legislators currently are not equipped even to understand the, 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 you know, the underlying stuff that's going on, never mind the overall ethics of the situation. To what extent, Dave, do you think um, the media, AI is a pretty popular topic, sexy topic, controversial topic, can use it to scare people, make them angry. Uh, to what extent do you think the media is actually in there muddying the waters? The media is a business and they are providing what people want. You know, they are being titillating to bring in the audiences and then they are... Uh, exaggerating issues to make those audiences keep watching the the local news that comes on normally it's a half half hour long show every single time there's about to be a commercial break they'll say coming up after the break we investigate the one thing in the kitchen that could kill you the fastest i think the the solution to that is not to regulate the media i think it's to educate the public to make the media look as ridiculous as it actually is i agree completely but but i mean just brainstorming i mean how would you actually do that? I mean, you, you're fighting a tidal wave. Yes, you, know? you are. We can't fix this by suddenly, you know, putting some, uh, you know, education channel on television and hoping people will watch it. I think it's going to be an, a generational thing. But right now, for example, they are... Oh, I see. Uh, so you're, you're thinking, sorry to interrupt you there, you're thinking potentially on a longer time scale of... Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, the, yeah. You know, secondary think, school education and things like that. And I'm thinking kindergarten, to be honest with you, going right. forward from there. I mean, and, and they're doing that, right? Mm -hmm. I think I think from day one, you know, the amount of media that kids are consuming nowadays, right? That I think, you know, entire first year of schooling is needs to be uh, how to be a cynic, how not to believe media, you know? Why, why you're looking at this media, what they're trying to do when you look at it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because... You're right. It's way too powerful right now, but it's not its fault. It's our fault for watching it. There's a there's a um, a thought. Uh, I mean, kind of coming coming firmly back into the tech space and kind of picking up on some of the things that we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, there are regulatory initiatives underway in the U.S. at the moment in terms of Twitter and Google and um, you know all party uh, initiative aimed at those. Um, do, do you think um, that? Big tech has um, got a bit too, a bit too um, sure of itself. Has got a bit too self-important. Has got itself into the stage where I mean, you, going back to what you said at the beginning, software is now, in, in paraphrasing what you said, powering and driving the world. Um, are we seeing a correction coming? It took us, and it's still taking us, a thousand years to work out even simple things 
about, say, the laws of libel and how those should be interpreted in a world that has print media and maybe television and radio. And now we suddenly have an order of magnitude increase in connectivity. And suddenly it's gone from being a easy to spot the culprit into being a free for all. We don't legislate to fix individual problems when those problems are actually symptomatic of our use of this system and not the system itself. I mean, people regulate Twitter if it like bans your guys, but not if it bans the other guys, you know? And I think that that's, that's, so what we're doing is we're giving control to whatever party happens to be in power and whichever companies they happen to favor. Um, so I don't think that's a, I think that's a really, really bad idea. At the same time, I think it's a really stupid thing for Twitter and Facebook to be policing posts because that then puts them in a position where they've accepted responsibility for those posts. The model I like to use is the postal service, that they're a common carrier and they do not open my mail. And I could write whatever I want, put it into a letter and send it to you and it gets to you. And if you take offense at that, that's my fault. It's not the post office's fault. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to do that at the same time, if I attempt to mail anthrax to you, then I am breaking laws and it's perfectly okay for post offices to have machines that sniff for anthrax going through their systems, not because they are the arbiters of what gets sent, but because sending anthrax is illegal. They, yeah. they, have, a, they have a technical procedure for applying the law. Right, exactly. And so I would like to see those same kind of common carrier rules applied to Twitter and Facebook. And then later on, when we have more experience with this, then we get to start applying, you know, standards or laws or whatever else we need. Those are great, great perspectives. Um, thanks for that. I mean, we, could, we could talk for a long time uh, about all those topics. All that remains is for me to thank you very much uh, for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. It's been super interesting. I've learned a lot. I've got a bit of a kicking in places on the testing. <laughs> no, 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 no. You got but, but in a nice way. I don't mind you kicking me. It's all good. Um, gentle, I, gent, gentle nudges. Gentle uh, nudges. That's all. <laughs> all good. Uh, so thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, I, I guess it would be very nice to think that uh, at some point in the future, you know, we could... Um, we could, we could pick up again. I don't, I don't know where this project will go, but hopefully it'll go somewhere interesting. And, and if it does, then maybe there'll be a, a part two to this at some point in the future. So thank you very much, Dave. I'd look forward to that. Thank you.